please welcome Steve Bannon. By the way, there's one correction. I, I'm not a, my, my daughter is a graduate of West Point. Uh, I'm not a graduate of the Naval Academy. I'm, I'm a Naval officer. Ah, there you go. A real Naval officer, not a graduate of the Naval Academy. No, I, we had good news. <laughs> All you Naval Academy grads out there, don't. We, we got very good news today. My daughter is a, uh, my daughter is a graduate of, of West Point, and a, uh, she's a, a member of the 326 Combat Engineers of the 101st Airborne, and uh, they got their orders, yeah. Well, no, that, that, that's the generation that we've got coming up. The, these are great kids. Uh, she actually got her orders uh, home today, so she'll be back in Fort Campbell uh, by Thanksgiving, so it's, uh, it's a day of celebration in our family. Um, yeah, she's, they're great kids, and I'll get to that in a second about what, we, uh, uh, what we've done to them, that generation. Uh, September 18th, 2008, at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the Republican appointed a chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Republican um, Secretary of the Treasury, a guy I used to work for at Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson, went to the White House to see the president, a Republican, I might add and uh, told him because of the mishandling of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers a few days before, you know, over the weekend on September 15th, where they didn't really calculate, because it's quite complicated, they didn't realize that Lehman Brothers was the beating heart of the world's commercial paper market, uh, and that the entire world and the commercial paper market is what funds the working capital of all the large corporations in the, in the world, that the world's financial system had basically frozen. And on Wednesday, for all you guys that have money market accounts, the prime reserve fund broke a buck for the first time. In other words, if you wrote a check for $1,000, you're going to get $900 back. Uh, the, um, the Fed had pumped $500 billion of liquidity in 24 hours into the system. Um, and by the way, we know all this now because of Representative Kanjorski, who told it on C-SPAN and because of testimony in front of Congress. Uh, they did the spreadsheets and ran the numbers. They went and told the president that um, they needed an immediate $1 trillion of liquidity into the system, or that the American financial system would freeze up and basically implode in 72 hours, that the world's financial system would implode in about three weeks, and that they could not guarantee um, any social and political chaos within a month. Uh, so President Bush sent him up to Capitol Hill. He didn't attend the meeting. He sent him up to Pelosi and Kanjorski and all these guys. And that's where they came up with TARP. Actually, Secretary Paulson went up with a three-page memo, if you remember. Uh, it was a bill. They needed a trillion dollars that night. Um, and the question gets to be, when you looked at the fiasco, and we'll go through some numbers in a second, um, how did a situation that, um, and we had some pretty sizable enemies in the 20th century. Hitler, Mussolini, the military junta in Japan, the Kaiser, uh, Lenin, Mao, Stalin, uh, you know, you go on and on and on. These guys couldn't even envision what we had done to ourselves, much less execute it. They actually told the president, unless you give us a trillion dollars immediately, and now we know from Bloomberg it was about $5 trillion of liquidity they needed into the system, of which, by the way, we've never really had an accounting, right? We don't have an accounting today of what really went on, of what liquidity got put into the system. This crisis is of such a magnitude. It's unprecedented in our country's history and unprecedented in the world's history. Let me just walk you through some math. Um, depending on the assumptions you make, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and I realize people say, oh, they're contingent liabilities, but they're, they're, they're pretty locked in unless you uncontingent them. The liabilities of those three are anywhere from 60 to $100 trillion. At state level, the state governments today are about $3 trillion underwater. Municipal governments, you see in Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania, I think just got taken over yesterday. Municipal governments, I think, are something like $2 trillion underwater. Uh, municipal uh, employee uh, pension funds are two trillion. Corporate pension funds are a trillion dollars. The biggest problem we have, which never gets talked about in any debate, has not been brought up one time, the trade deficit, 
which every quarter, all the goods we buy from China and all the foreign oil we buy, it's seven trillion dollars. It's the beating heart of our problem. Not one question in eight debates has been asked about it. Doctor, there's a guy named Dr. Kotlikoff, he's on my radio show, in the Reagan administration, Harvard trained PhD, head of Boston University's economics department, very low key guy. They call him the $200 trillion man. He will walk you through a set of mathematics that shows you the liability side of the balance sheet's about $200 trillion. And his math is not that far off when you look at the assumptions. The total assets in our country, let's, let's talk about a balance sheet and an income statement so you can see the scale of the problem we got. All the assets combined, I think, in our country, all the stocks, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, privately held companies, LLCs, all of your companies, okay? All the cash, all the gold, all the real estate adds up to about 50 to $60 trillion in assets. And we have $200 trillion, and some of those are contingent liabilities. But we are upside down. The industrial democracies have a massive problem today we've never had. We are highly overleveraged. We have to go through a massive deleveraging. And we've built in a welfare state that is completely and totally unsupportable. Now, why this is a crisis, and by the way, Barack Obama is not the problem. Barack Obama is a symptom of a problem. We have to remove Barack Obama. I, I, I don't doubt that for a second. We, we, we have to remove Barack Obama as President of the United States. But that's only the, and let's talk about this. We had this huge, the reason you're here today on a Tuesday night, listening to some really great guys who are sacrificing their, their, their lives and, and you guys to come to support in one of these new organizations, when you could be doing anything else, and you're the kind of the thin blue line of, what, of what's going to save us, because I go around and talk to, to groups. Last night I was in Torrance. It's 100 people. It's always the same 100 guys, men and women, throughout the country every time I go. Okay? That's the scary thing. You, you are the guys who are really going to save us. So, so the, the, the problem is, is that these numbers are so esoteric that even the guys on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, the guys I work with, and the guys in the Treasury Department, because they've made some massive mistakes, and they're the first to admit that. But it's so tough to tie this together because the numbers are so esoteric when you talk about a trillion and a half dollar deficits and trillion, three trillion dollar in federal spending and all this. It's the reason the Tea Party, after Santelli's rant, the reason the Tea Party revolt came about, it's the first time in our country's history that we've had a center-right movement principally led by women, right? If you look at the Tea Party, for the Jasons and all the guys, and I was out there in the, in the Americans First Prosperity and all the guys, this was the first time there were women out there, right, moms. And the reason it is is that women's are the, the women are the chief operating officer of the American family. You know, they don't need to know what's trillions of dollars. They know that every bag of groceries is 100 bucks. They know to fill up an SUV is 100 bucks. And they know that Buddy and Sis are going to a state college, state university, coming back $50,000 in debt and living back in, the, you know, in their room with the soccer trophies they got with, 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 no, with no job prospects. The reason I named the first film Generation Zero, the, the generation in their 20s and 30s, we, we've wiped them out. This is the first time in American history a generation's actually cha you know, given over command of something and we haven't passed on any positive increase in net worth. Right? The sad thing about the Occupy Wall Street, when you look at those kids, is how ill-informed they are. That's the product. That's the product of the American education system. They have no more earthly idea of the fundamentals of our liberty, the fundamentals of free market capitalism, and they know zero, absolutely nothing about our history. That's why I call them Generation Zero. We've passed on zero net worth, and we've really you know, and, and yet I see part of that, my daughter's part of that generation, that are fighting a war that's tougher than any war that our grandparents fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. So there is tremendous potential there. But we are passing them on unless we act immediately, unless groups like you can come together, because the political establishment is not going to do it. And people go, how can you say that? I say, let's just look at the empirical evidence. Since the Tea Party revolt, which the Republican establishment did not support, and if you remember and look back, go to Fox and look at guys I respect tremendously. 
William Crystal, Dr. Krautheimer, David Fromm, you look at all the, George Will, look at all the intelligentsia of the Republican Party and the, and, and the conservative uh, intelligentsia. They were mocking the Tea Party. They were mocking these grassroots organizations. The reason I made these films is that my buddies on Wall Street kept saying, oh, these women are a bunch of bimbos. Or, I said, you know, I know Governor Palin and I know um, Congressman Bachman, I know these women of the Tea Party. They're every bit as tough and smart as you guys are. I mean, think about it. If the elites are so good, how did we get in this jam? Right? And, but, here's the, but here's the part that, that, and that's why groups like you, I'm not promoting you. If, if you don't hang together, this country falls apart. Well, becomes something very different at the other side of this crisis, because this is the fourth great crisis in American history. We had the revolution, we had the Civil War, we had the Great Depression of World War II. This is the great fourth turning in American history. And we're gonna be one thing on the other side. And by the way, the reason this is so tough is that before we didn't have competitors like China, uh, or we weren't in hock to guys that are our enemies, or we had an education and a value system of Judeo-Christian values that a guy like Abraham Lincoln could read the King James Bible, Shakespeare's plays, and Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, and that's all he had, right? And he, that he wrote the second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address, because that's all you needed, right? Um, if you look at it for a second, this, the, the victory in 2010, and because of groups of Club for Growth, Americans for Prosperity, the Tea Party movement, grassroots movement, it was an unprecedented victory right? Not only at the federal level, if you go down and look at the state level, if you look at, we eviscerated the Democratic Party in the South, in the Midwest, in state legislatures, in, in governorships, it was a massive victory. We, we got virtually no credit for that, right? The mainstream media and even the, even the Republican apparatus, remember the Republican Party came out with a marketing document 60 days before that that said we're going to cut $100 billion, the Pledge to America, right? Okay. The two big things, TARP being one, the second being the, the, the budget cuts after the 2010, right, the first budget, we cut $30 billion. And by the way, the Tea Party Patriots, if you go to Jenny Beth Martin and Mark Meckler's site, they say we actually increased by $3 billion. But it was a $30 billion cut, not a $100 billion cut because of all kind of, you know, we're, you know, we're prorated, we're in the year. The second was the debt debate. The federal spending which is every bit as bad as the deficit. It's the scale of federal spending because it sucks dollars out from everywhere else. Federal spending, I think, is 3.5 trillion, 3.75 trillion for the next two years, roughly. It adds up to seven and a half trillion dollars in two years. In the debt debate we just had, we cut 60 billion dollars. 20 billion one year and 40 billion the next. The, the numbers, those numbers are irrelevant, right? Because the system lacks the political courage to actually take it on. The hardest, nastiest days. If you look at Europe, just look what's happening. Look what happened in the House of Commons yesterday when some conservatives stood up and said, we've had it with Europe. We want out. We want out of this whole mess. And they turned on each other. I said this on Hannity back in February 2010 when he had me. They had a special for Generation Zero, the first time outside the Passion of the Christ they'd ever taken an hour for one movie. And I said, all the easy choices are in back of us. All the easy decisions were years ago. Everything from here on in is going to be hard and nasty and ugly, and you're going to be called every name in the book. You're going to be vilified. And we did cross a line this, this past week on the Occupy Wall Street. Only, I believe, in the revolution were there any marches on Tories' houses. When they left and they marched on um, Rupert Murdoch's house and Jamie Dimon's house and Mr. Koch's house, uh, and there was one other, four houses they actually marched on. That shows you the types of things that are going to happen. Cutting this budget, the, why is the budget not cut? Budget's not cut because it's not easy to cut. Everybody's going to have to take a hit here. And if we draw a line, and it has to be a tough line that no more taxes. No more tax increases. You're just, you're just exacerbating a problem. You're, you're going to see this election. Newt Gingrich said on my show the other night, he thinks it's the most important since 1860. I think this election is going to be the nastiest, ugliest, 
in the history of this country. It's going to be Americans for Prospect. I, I end the film, The Undefeated. By the way, the film's not about Sarah Palin. It is Sarah Palin's story. But the reason I wanted to do it is that she is Walmart Nation. When the movie starts off, she's working on a commercial fishing boat in 1988 with her husband. They own a small commercial fishing boat. And she's not part of the, the cultural, political, economic, or social elite in the Matsu Valley, which is out of the loop in a state that's out of the loop, right? She is so obscure. She's more obscure than anybody in America today when she starts off. And 20 years later, she's risen by being constant on a handful of principles. But the undefeated is the values of the Tea Party. It's the values. I've been around this country now for three years, showing these films and talking to these Tea Party groups. And these are the people that are, as Rick Santelli so brilliantly observed, they're those who carry the water, not those who drink the water. They're the ones that hold our social organizations together, build our cities, run our little leagues, fight our wars, right? It's the backbone of this country. And they're enraged, and here's why they're enraged. They understand we have a system now that has socialism, as you pointed out so eloquently. We have socialism for the very poor, right? A system that a trillion dollars a year in welfare state benefits with no taxes, right? And 60% of the country getting that. And we have socialism for the very wealthy, right? The, the, the anger of the Tea Party is not racism. It's not, they're not homophobes. They're not nativist. What they are is common sense, practical, middle class people that understand that they're paying for their own and their children's destruction, right? And that's the rage. You know, the bonus pool this year, the bonus pool on Wall Street of all the financial firms in 2000 in Seven, the year before, in 2006 and 2007, the two years were all the transactions that imploded in 2008. The bonus pool is, is going to be about the same this year, right? You know, TARP, when you when said TARP, well, TARP, if, if our business, if your business or your business had gotten in trouble in Goldman Sachs, where I was trained, had come in and given you a, a, a financing, trust me, you would have been wiped out and you would have been fired, right? They weren't. All their stock is still is worth a ton of money because they weren't. We basically gave them free money and bailed them out. There's no recession in the Hamptons. There's no recession in Georgetown. The other day, the Washington Post reports five of the seven wealthiest counties in the country are the suburbs of Washington, D.C. The per capita income in Washington, D.C., for the first time in history, is greater than Silicon Valley. That is not a random event. What Sarah Palin, the reason I wanted to make the movie, Sarah Palin went up against the political class in Alaska and big oil. Because it, it wasn't that it was corrupt. There's always going to be corruption. There's always going to be bad guys taking money. That's human nature. Read Plutarch. That happened back in Greece and Rome. We have something much worse. A compromised political class. Crony capitalism in a permanent political class. Right? It's quite simple. How does a guy go to Washington basically making $100,000 a year as a lawyer in some locality, and at the end of 10 years, on $165,000 and another $15,000 by federal money he can make, was having to keep basically sometimes two locations, how's his net worth $5 million? And in 10 years, like Harry Reid, how's Harry Reid's net worth $15 million? That's not even a mathematics, that's just arithmetic. How does that work? That's what the Tea Party, that's what this revolt is about. That's why we have grassroots organizations like AFP and Club for Growth. That's why we have things outside political parties, because people want their voice heard. You are the last line of defense. Three nights a week I do this throughout the country, and it's always the same hundred people in the room. But I will tell you, as Slade said so eloquently, if you look at the revolution, about a third of the people wanted liberty, a third of the people were hardcore Tories, and about a third were at, well, like in the middle and saying, I'm gonna see how this thing plays out, right? Our country today is about the same thing. We're a center-right nation of probably 70, 30 center-right, but there's only a small core that's prepared to take their Tuesday night and not just write a check, but actually throw your being like Jason and the team have in trying to change this. Right? And that's what's going to save it. A hundred years from now when they look back, 
if we come out of this crisis and we're still the country that Mark, Senator Rubio talked about of American exceptionalism based upon Judeo-Christian values, right? Believing in freedom and being the greatest country in the world in the torture freedom, if we're that country and it's gonna take us 20 years to get through this, right? It's gonna be because of guys like you. And if you quit, we are done. Right? We're going to be something very different on the other side. I mean, you can already see in, in President Obama, you can already see what that's going to be. Because right? that's just the harbinger. The Occupy Wall Street. I, I tell guys, don't dismiss these kids. Listen to them. Because it's a shot in the heart of what they believe. And that is off the, the education system that's taken more money than any education system in the history of the world. Listen to what they believe. That's the future. If you guys don't stand tall, so I, I want to conclude tonight in saying that I'm actually energized. And you know why? Think about it. I know all you guys do this. You all, you've all read history books since you were kids. And you all think, hey, if I was there during the Civil War, you know, I'd be right in the middle of it. Or if I was in the, revolu if the revolution, I would be right there, right? Or in World War II, or the Great Depression, all that stuff that guys had the Great Depression, or World War II, I would be there. I'd be in Normandy. I'd do all that. We have that opportunity today, right? They're going to look back at these 10 years, 15 years, and it's going to take us that long. And we're going to have, by the way, we're going to have defeats. There's going to be days when it looks, that's why you, I, I want you guys to see the movie, the, the, the um, um, Generation Zero. Because the guy at the end of it tells you, kind of gives a broad perspective. There are going to be days that's going to look so gray and so overcast and like we've lost, like the day Obama won. We're going to have more days like that. But if we hold together and we see in exactly what you said, there's so many people that believe in what we believe and understand when you start talking to them and engaging them that we're, you know, we're not cloven hoof devils. We're not nativist, homophobic, racist right? But they, they understand that we believe in what made this country great, and they believe it too. But they're inundated with a mass media and an education system that's really stolen that from them. And for every Drudge or Andrew Breitbart or these little things you have, for every AFP and for every Club for Growth and for every one of these organizations, you've got this overwhelming apparatus and apathy. Apathy of the middle and apparatus on the left. But we can do it. And I've seen it. And we've seen it in 2010. That victory was humongous. And I realize people, some people are upset that Governor Palin's not running or they're, they're searching for the man on the white horse and one day it's Governor Perry and one day it's Herman Cain, everything like that. It's not about any one individual. It's about teams. It's about doing this. It's about next year when we have this, on the first annual shareholders meeting, we have 500 people in this room. And half of them are under the age of 40. It's ideas, and it's, it's, it's taking those ideas in action. And trust me, you guys are on the right path. This is not a waste of your time. Because if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And if it doesn't get done, we're going to lose this country. And we're going to be looked at, listen, this is the last thing I want to leave you with. Only one, gen I think there's been 14 generations in this country's history. Only one generation is looked down as not having fulfilled the Berkey and Compact, which is, we owe as much to the people who came before us as the people before us. We're an agent in time, right? And we have a sacred duty to withhold traditions of the past, our best traditions, and pass them on to the future. Only one generation in our history didn't do that. That was the generation of leadership before the Civil War. Civil War could have been averted. It wasn't because of a failure of leadership. We are the baby boomers in this room. We're the second generation that's going to be looked at as having let this country down unless we turn immediately and get our hands around the problem. And through the Tea Party, through these grassroots movements, through things like Liberty Restoration, we're doing that. And, and trust me, there's tremendous power in doing this. So thank you very much. I'm here to help you guys anytime you want.